our Lord said, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is an amazing thing that you would desire to save a single sinner by grace. It is an amazing thing that you would shed the blood of your own Son to redeem a single soul into eternity. We cannot yet grasp the magnitude of the sacrifice made by Christ, but we want to know it. We want to understand it this morning, Father, so that we might know that, in fact, we have entered through the narrow gate and we have found life in Christ. We want to know it this morning, Father, that we might live our lives here on this side of heaven, bringing Him the honor and the glory and the majesty that He rightly deserves as Your Son and as our Savior. We cannot worship Him rightly apart from the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And so we ask, Spirit, that You would do a mighty work among us this morning, that You would help our hearts to receive Your Word, that You would quicken our minds to be receptive to the truth, that You would give us full assurance that we have Christ and therefore we have life. And if we do not, Father, then by Your grace and mercy, save all present this morning who do not know You. Do a mighty work here, I pray. In Christ's holy name, amen. Good morning. I pray you are well this morning. I'm thankful you're here. I'm thankful to be here to have an opportunity to proclaim the gospel of grace. It is a most amazing and daunting task to open up God's word and speak on behalf of God. There is no man who has ever been qualified for that other than God making that man qualified through his spirit. We're, we're in between a series right now. We just finished up Ecclesiastes and we're going to be picking up Colossians in two weeks. And last week we had a chance to hear Kirk preach on forgiveness. And in light of that teaching, I want to talk this morning about biblical conversion. Who has received the forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ? Who is that? And how do you know if you have actually been converted, if you've actually been redeemed? Presumption and to be presumptuous can often lead to great disappointment in life. If at the age of 20, you presume to be married by the time you're 25, and yet find yourself single when you're 35, you will likely be disappointed in the fact that you have yet to find a spouse. If you go to school and you work really hard and you get your degree with the expectation that when you graduate, you're going to get a good job that pays decent money that you can sustain your life here in Silicon Valley, only to find yourself bagging groceries with an MBA, you will likely be disappointed. As trying as these failed expectations may be, marriage, work, academia, there is one presumption, one expectation that you must ensure is fulfilled in your life, and that is your conversion. It is a presumption, a mistake that you cannot make. You cannot say to yourself, I am a Christian and not be a Christian. You cannot say, I am converted, when in fact you have not been converted, because that mistake is eternal. As glorious as this day is, this Lord's day, when we have hundreds of thousands of people gathering in houses that have been declared for this purpose to worship and glorify God, it is simultaneously one of the most heartbreaking days of the week. Because in the midst of God's people are many who profess Christ and have been baptized and attend church but have never been converted. And how many more outside the churches on this day, never hearing Christ, not having any understanding of life after death? Jesus said there are many who presume salvation. There are many who expect heaven. 
He said there are many who anticipate spending an eternity with God who will come before God on the great day of judgment and hear Christ say to them, I never knew you. I am thankful for the sermon from last week. I, I'm thankful that we had a word of encouragement about how we are forgiven in Christ. I, I left so encouraged. There is no greater word you can receive. You cannot hear someone say to you, your sins have been forgiven and forgotten by God as far as the east is from the west. You cannot contemplate coming into the presence of a holy God knowing that you've been set free from your sin and you've been given the righteousness of Christ. There is no greater thought. And at the same time, my heart was broken, thinking how many heard that message last week and think they are forgiven when they have not been. How many? How many here? How many in this church? If you presume to be a Christian when in fact you have not been washed by the blood of Christ, that presumption, never being born again, never transformed, never made alive by the Holy Spirit of God is the worst presumption that you can ever make. There is no mistake greater. And yet we live in a time when the culture and even the church presses hard upon us to say, don't worry about it, it's okay. Just go to church, just be good, just get baptized, just do something, it's okay, it's easy. That's not what Christ said here. The culture wants to say the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to life and those who enter by it are many. Many churches want to say the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to destruction and those who find it are few. That's the opposite of what Christ said. I want to listen to my Lord. I want us as a church to listen to our Lord. I suppose most of you believe there is a judgment to come. I imagine if I took a survey, I'd get 98%. I suppose also that most of us agree that that judgment will be contingent upon our faith. Faith in Jesus Christ, we ascend to be with him in heaven. Lack of faith in Jesus Christ, and we descend to be with Satan and the demons and all unrepentant sinners in hell. I suppose as well that regardless of your way of life, you hope to be with God in heaven. I hope that too. I pray that for you. I hope and pray it for myself. But if we base our hopes upon the cultural moment, or if we base our hopes of conversion on how we feel and not the word of God, then even though we hope one day to be there, if we presume it, if we anticipate it, if we expect it, but we have not been converted, then when we die, we will not arrive and I imagine this morning, if we could, if we could look upon the tens of thousands of lives, souls gathered in churches this morning, and look into their lives, I imagine for many, we would see much bad fruit. We would see a wide gate and an easy path, and the end being destruction, not life, even though they claim Christ. I imagine also that although we call ourselves Christians and we become defensive when someone questions that, we say, how dare you question my salvation? I believe Christ when he said many are called and few are chosen. I believe Christ. I believe Christ when he said the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. That should cause us to pause and listen with all our might. I don't want any of us to be fooled. I don't want to be fooled. I don't want to come before Christ on that day and him say to you, you preached for 30 years and I do not know you. Not in this place. Not this church. I don't want any of us to be fooled. So by God's grace this morning, 
I want to teach you three things on conversion. They're simple, and yet we must understand them. I want to teach you about the narrow path that leads to life so that you will find it, so that you will have Christ. Let's look this morning at three things. One, the universal call to the narrow gate. The universal call to the narrow gate. Number two, the divine overcoming of the wide gate. And number three, how do we know? I mean, what are the marks that we've actually found life? So let's hear God call all mankind to the narrow gate that they might live. Let's see how God exercises his power through his Son and the Holy Spirit to overcome the wide gate and the easy path that we are all on. And then let's ask ourselves, how can we know? I mean, don't you want to walk out of here saying, I know, I know Christ. I know that. I do. Was that too hard of an introduction? I pray not. I, I, I don't want to sting your ears, but I want you to listen with all your might. These teachings Christ said, he wasn't joking, nor can we. Number one, the universal call to the narrow gate. In Matthew chapter 7, many of you know this, we did a series on it years ago, several years ago, in retrospect. This is the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. And this is our Lord's, one of our Lord's finest sermons. And he's beginning to wrap the sermon up. And as he gets to chapter 7, he begins to talk about heaven and hell and those who will reside in each. What are the conditions of those who will reside in each? And as he begins to close his sermon, he closes with these remarks, enter by the narrow gate. And he says that so that all might be saved. Look at verse 13 again. Enter by the narrow gate, he said, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. That word enter in the Greek, it's an imperative. It's a command. He's not giving us a suggestion. He's not stating an opinion. He's saying to all people everywhere, enter by the narrow gate. Live. Have life. What a glorious command. We call this the universal call that God calls everybody, everywhere, throughout all of human history to repent and believe and have eternal life. He calls everybody, young and old, rich and poor, educated, ill-educated, male, female, children. He calls everyone to enter this narrow gate that they might have life. Jesus says, get off the easy path. Get away from the wide gate that leads to destruction. Come to me that he, we might have life. And this, my beloved, is how gracious and loving our Heavenly Father is. He doesn't just say to Israel or Cambrian Park or the United States or Nigeria or Iran or the Philippines, come and be saved to all people everywhere, always. God calls salvation. He calls man to be saved. The Bible says he does not take pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. Ezekiel 18:33. The Bible says he does not want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Bible says in Acts chapter 17, verse 30, if you remember the Apostle Paul, he was speaking at the Oropagus in Athens, and listen to what he said. He said, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent and live. God desires salvation for every soul that is conceived in every womb of every mother in all of human history. The Puritan Richard Baxter once thundered from the pulpit this. When I read it, it gave me chills. Shall the living God send so earnest a message to his creatures, and should they not obey, that message being life? Hearken then all you that live after the flesh, the Lord that gave thee thy breath and being hath sent a message to thee from heaven, and this is his message. Turn ye, turn ye, why will ye die? Why die? Why die when your creator calls you to live? Our Lord issued this call to enter the narrow gate to all men because he knows he knows that we are depraved. He knows that we need salvation. But he also knows we have a conscience. We have a will. We have an understanding. And we may not, as we'll see in a moment, we may not have the power 
to be saved independent of God saving us. But man is not like the beast of the field. And if you're a reformed person, listen closely to this, please. You're made in the image of God. You're made in the likeness of God. And that means you have the capacity to understand truth. You have a conscience. You have the ability to make volitional choices. We are responsible for the choices that we make. We are spiritual creatures. We are moral creatures. And therefore, God commanding man to be saved is a reasonable command. It is a glorious command. It is an appropriate command given our natures as men and women created in his image. He doesn't command the rocks to repent and believe. He doesn't command the fish or the birds or the trees to repent and believe. He commands man to enter the narrow gate, those made in his image. Spiritual, moral creatures responsible for their own actions. Now, some critics of Reformed theology, they argue this. Because we say that a man must be born again in order to live, they say this call by God, this universal call for all people everywhere to be saved, cannot be legitimate. It, it's an insincere call. And they'll, they'll argue that we cannot make that claim because unless God makes someone alive, they'll remain dead. But our being spiritually dead and therefore refusing to come to God when he calls does not nullify the sincerity, authenticity, or the power of that call or the one who's making the call, and that is God himself. Does not nullify it. Many of you know and have received Kirk and Sarah are sending out wedding invitations. They're already getting responses. Some people are saying, yes, we're going to be there. Others saying, no, we cannot make it. But if you ask Kirk and Sarah, they will tell you they want every single person on that list to be present. Every invitation went out. It was an authentic, sincere invitation by the, those doing the inviting for those people to come. So it's not the invitation that is faulty. With Christ, it's not the invitation by God to repent and believe and enter the narrow gate that's faulty. The problem is with the one being invited. It's the refusal to come. It's the refusal to live. And therefore, we can say... All blame and all responsibility rests upon those who refuse to enter the narrow gate and live. Jesus Christ meant it. God the Father means it. He wants all people to repent and believe. And therefore, this universal call, far from being insincere, it actually dignifies its hearers as human beings, as those made in the image of God, intelligent, personal, morally accountable people those God sincerely desires to enjoy a proximity and an intimacy with in Christ that he desires with no other created thing, not even the angels, not even the angels. The gospel of grace, my beloved, is a well-meant offer to all people for all time. When Jesus declared that if you come to him, he will give you rest, he will receive you by faith, he meant it, excludes no one. And if that's true, and I believe it is, I believe the universal call is clearly taught in Scripture, then we must ask this question. Why is the road to destruction populated by so many? And why the road to eternal life by so few? That's what Christ said. The wide gate and the easy path that leads to destruction is populated by many. The narrow gate and the hard path is populated by only a few. Surely we must conclude that many want to live, if not all, and we must also conclude that many, if not all, do not want to perish. So where's the problem in this? It's not in the invitation, it's the one being invited. Point number two, the divine overcoming of the wide gate. The divine overcoming of the wide gate. The broad path, the wide path, the easy path that leads to destruction is populated by many because, listen closely, no one will enter the narrow gate. No one will come to Christ on his own. The universal call is insufficient for a single soul to come to a saving grace. And that means our fallen nature 
the depth of the sin in our own heart, the condition of mankind in his fallen state is so dark and so depraved and so lost that he cannot on himself enter the narrow gate. He is unable. He is helpless. He is powerless. In other words, our sin has rendered us spiritually blind, and therefore you cannot see the kingdom of God, as Christ said you must in John chapter 3. Our sin and our rebellion has rendered us spiritually deaf, so we cannot hear God when God says, enter the narrow gate and live. Our desire to be like God has rendered us morally insubordinate. So when God says to us, come, repent of your sins, believe in my son, and live, we say, no, we will not, because we're not going to obey you. We're not going to follow you. So the wide gate and the easy path is all that we know as sinners. We can go one step further. The wide gate and the easy path is all that we want as sinners. We know it and we want it, and we don't want any other option, not a narrow gate, not a hard path, and certainly not Jesus Christ as Lord. Jesus said to the Jews in John chapter 5, and this applies for all of us, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. And now we're right at it. What is the problem? What is the heart of the problem? It is the heart of man. God invites, God calls, God commands, live, live, live. And we say, no, we will not. We refuse to come that we might have life. <clears throat> so what else is needed? The universal call goes out to all men in all time. What else is needed in order for us to enter through the narrow gate that we might find life? Does anyone here not want to enter the narrow gate? Is there a single person in this room, saved or unsaved, says, no, I want the broad gate. I want the easy path that leads to destruction. I want an eternity of torment and hell and the weeping of gnashing of teeth. Who would say that? No one. So let's listen. Sinful man needs what we call an effectual call, an inward call. God coming and doing a mighty work on your rebellious heart. This is what every man needs. The effectual call is God's movement to cause an effect, to bring about a result. What is that? What is the effect? That we might actually enter the narrow gate, that you might actually see Christ and see your sins and repent and believe and be saved. This is the effect that he wants. This is the effect that I want. I want it on me. I want it on you. In other words, God's conditional promise. Now listen closely. His conditional promise, Acts 16, 31, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Here's the condition. Believe and you will be saved. Do not believe, you will not be saved. That's a conditional promise. It must be matched with God's unconditional promise, and that is to make belief happen. So the conditional promise, believe in the Lord and you will be saved, must be matched in a person with God's unconditional promise, him giving you the faith to believe. Ezekiel 36, 26, I think one of the best passages on this. God said, I, God, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. In other words, I'm going to call you externally. You're going to hear the call, and I'm going to call you internally. I'm going to come in with my Holy Spirit. I'm going to take out your, your, your rebellious, deceitful heart, and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh that knows me and loves me and wants to follow my son. And they must come together. External and internal, universal and effectual, conditional promise and unconditional promise, coming together to save a soul. Listen to how John Bunyan put it. The conditional promise calls for repentance. We're called to repent. The absolute promise gives it. The conditional promise calls for faith. The unconditional promise gives it. The conditional promise calls for a new heart. The unconditional promise gives it. The conditional promise calls for, the whole, for holy obedience. The unconditional, absolute promise causes it. Both are necessary. You must hear, and God must do a work. Conditional and unconditional coming together at the exact same time. 
that make sense? It's important that it makes sense. If I, for example, were to tell Brandon, I said, Brandon, I want you to, to go out to the airport, I want you to rent a small aircraft, and I want you to fly up to Seattle, Tacoma area, and visit all of our family up there. He'd look at me and he'd probably think, well, you're out of your mind because I don't know how to fly. I'm not going to do that. It's very dangerous. I have no desire to do that at this point in time. I'm ill-trained. I don't have the, the capacity. But what if, what if I change that? What if I gave him the same command? Go to the airport, rent a small plane, go visit your family, and I simultaneously provided the aircraft, the fuel, the training, and the desire for him to go. He would go. He would love it. He'd take the flight, he'd visit the family, he'd come back, and we rejoice in the great work that took place. This is what God does for his elect. For those, the Bible says, who've been ordained before the foundations of the world to be saved, God calls them, universal call, they hear, and then he calls them, effectual call, by going inside, grabbing onto their heart, and changing them. And he does all this effectual work, this internal transforming work through his son, through the cross. All of it was accomplished at Calvary. In other words, he comes to you and he says, here's the airplane, here's the fuel, here's the transportation, here's the flight plan, and here's the desire. And then you say, well, let's go fly. I mean, let's follow Christ and let's fly. On the cross, Jesus Christ fulfilled all the conditions that we were unable to fulfill. He fulfilled them. He fulfilled the conditional promise and the unconditional promise. So we can respond to him when he says, repent and believe and be saved. We can actually respond in faith. When he says, enter the narrow gate, we can actually enter the narrow gate. Because Jesus Christ, in living a sinless life, and that means he actually did every moment of every day, love God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. He did that. He did that. He lived the life that we were supposed to live in perfect, loving obedience and submission to God the Father. He did that. And then, if that wasn't enough, as a sinless sacrifice, he climbed upon the cross and he died the death that you and I as sinners were supposed to die. And not just a physical death upon the cross, but you heard Kirk talk about last week. This is eternal damnation. This is the weeping and gnashing of teeth, the outer darkness Christ bore in his body on the cross. Your sins, my sins, for all who repent and believe. He did the effectual work. He did that. And he did it. So that instead for us, instead of us experiencing God's wrath, God's punishment for our sins, what do we get instead? We get the holiness of Christ. We get the righteousness of God that's given to us freely by grace through faith. You don't have to earn it. By God's grace through faith, you're given the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so you change. You change as a man. You go from someone, maybe when you were younger, maybe when you were older, you heard the universal call. Someone said to you, they told you the gospel. They told you that God is a holy God and that you are a sinner. And you, maybe you said, I know that I'm a sinner. And they said, repent and believe and put your faith in Christ and you'll be saved. And you heard that, but you never had a desire to. I mean, you didn't want to. You said, the flesh is more appealing. This life I'm living now is better for me. And then something happened because God came to you, and suddenly, or maybe not so suddenly for some, you, you actually desired to be saved, and you desired to follow Christ, and you, you wanted to know the Bible, and you wanted to start coming to church, and you wanted to get baptized. And what's, what's happened? The effectual call's taken place. You've been given a new heart, a heart that desires the things of God, a heart that desires to hear God speak, a heart that desires to do God's will a heart that desires Christ above all else. And when that change takes place, you truly are a new man or a new woman in Christ. You want the righteousness of Jesus and not your own. You give it up. Say, I don't want mine. Give me his. You don't want to be at war with God anymore. You want peace in your life with God through Christ. So no longer must you presume. No longer must you question. Because when the effectual call comes... And God makes you alive. You've been converted. You're no longer dead. You've come into the light. Completely forgiven. All your sins forgotten. And now you stand before God in Christ. 
I loved how Kirk put it last week. You used to be a liar, and you're not a liar anymore. And you used to be an adulterer because you lusted after members of the opposite sex all the time, and now you're not an adulterer anymore. You used to be a murderer because you committed murder in your mind, and now you're not a murderer anymore. When he said that, I thought, how can that be? I am a liar, but not in Christ. I did not lie in Christ. I am a murderer, but not in Christ because Christ did not murder, and I have his record now. Everything changes. The effectual call of God upon a man makes the universal call to repentance and faith possible. It takes the impossible, and it makes it possible. Without God moving upon a person's heart, they may hear the call, but they'll never respond. They will not respond because they cannot respond. Paul tells us in Romans 8, 7, for the mind, listen, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it, most important word, cannot. Cannot. No ability, no power. The Bible tells us that no one seeks after God, no, not one, Romans chapter 3. The Bible tells us that our sins render us unable to believe, John 12, 39. The Bible tells us that we cannot yield good fruit, Romans, I mean, Matthew 7, 17, and that this is the most brutal, 2 Corinthians 3, 5, Paul says that we cannot even possess a good thought. I can't even possess a good thought apart from Christ. But the effectual call comes in and makes the universal call possible, makes the impossible possible. A sinner who's dead can be made alive by God. I don't know if you remember in the wake of the rich young ruler who came to Christ and said, what must I do to enter the kingdom of heaven? Christ talked to him in this great dialogue and told him he must go and sell all of his possessions, give it to the boar, and come follow him. And the man went away downcast, downcast. And the disciples turned to him and they said, Lord, who then can be saved? I mean, this guy was the picture of salvation. If this guy wasn't getting in, no one was getting in. And Jesus said to his disciples with great love in his heart in Matthew 19, Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. With man, it's impossible to be saved by the universal call alone, but with God, it is possible to be saved by the effectual call, the transformation of your own heart. The effectual call illuminates the mind. It transforms the heart, and it inclines the will of man. It inclines your will to know God and to love Christ and to want to be obedient to his laws. We call this regeneration. I like the term born again. You were dead, and now you've been made alive. You were lost, and now you've been found. Your whole life is in the darkness, and then Christ comes, and he makes you alive, and everything becomes light. In other words, you've been converted. Converted from a child of darkness to a child of light. Converted from a son or daughter of Satan to a son of, or daughter of Yahweh. You've been converted. The necessity of an effectual call for a man to be able and willing to enter the narrow gate by definition renders impotent, powerless, any external act or religious exercise that you attempt to do in order to accomplish the same end. It's impotent. There is no power apart from God making you alive. And this means something, my friends, and listen closely. It means that an unconverted man may go to church his whole life. He may hear sermons and teachings that he really likes. He may even appreciate the power of God's word. It means that he can give generously of his time and his money to the poor or to the weak or to the gospel ministry. He may believe that he is a sinner. He may even believe that he needs Christ in order to be saved. He may even believe that Christ is the way and the truth and the life and that no one comes to the Father except through him. He may believe all this. He may feel guilty over his sins. He may, feel, he may confess his sins regularly. He may read his Bible. He may attend the small group. He may be a pastor preaching from a pulpit. If God has not made that man alive, he is still dead. If an effectual call has not come upon that man's heart, regardless of his external exercise, all his religion, all his movement... He is still dead.
Conversion from the wide gate to the narrow gate requires the work of God. It's not simply saying a prayer. It's not simply making a profession of faith. It's not getting baptized. It's not owning or reading a Bible. God must do a work. In the Westminster Catechism, we've taught this. We believe this. Effectual calling, listen, is the work of God's Spirit whereby convincing us of our sin and misery, enlightening our minds in the knowledge of Christ, and renewing our wills, he does persuade and enable us to embrace Jesus Christ freely offered to us in the gospel. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It persuades you. It woos you. It draws you in. So you must have God, and you must have Christ. Jesus was right when he said no one no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and then I will raise him up on the last day. No one. No one. So in regards to conversion, Jesus calls the sinner to be saved, and then for the elect, he does what? He equips the sinner to be saved. He enables them to answer the call. He sends out his messengers, and he has for centuries throughout the world. We call them missionaries. You are a missionary. You've been sent here to bring the gospel to everyone. Why? Because God calls all people to repent and believe. But how are they going to know this call unless they hear? And how are they going to hear unless what? Unless we go. So he sends out this message to everyone everywhere, be saved, enter the narrow gate, do not perish but live. And then, for those chosen, those ordained, he saves them. He moves upon them in a mighty way. This, my beloved, is such glorious news. I mean, this is the glorious news of the gospel of grace, that God, through the work of Christ, will save people. Some of you don't look too convinced. You may be saying this to yourself, this is no help at all. If Christ must do the work, if God must do something on the inside in order for me to be saved, if I can't just get baptized, if I can't just make a simple profession or say a sinner's prayer, but I must be saved by God, by this internal calling, then how do I know if I've been saved? How can I offer hope to someone if God must do the work? How can I have any assurance that this work's been done on me, that I haven't been fooling myself all along? How do I know I'm not like one of those people that Christ talks about in a few more verses in Matthew 7? How do I know I haven't been fooled? And on that day, Christ said, some will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? How do I know that Christ will not say to me, I never knew you, depart from me, you worker of lawlessness? How do I know that? Oh, my beloved, I got to know that. You've got to know that. We cannot wait for the day when we come into his presence and to stand before God and think that we have assurance of salvation to presume heaven to be wrong. It must not happen. It cannot happen. So what are the marks? Do you want to know them? I want to know them. What are the marks of those who find life? First, let me note this. Everyone who wants to be saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ will be saved. Did you hear that? That's an important distinction to make. Every single soul who wants to be saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone will in fact be saved. And we know that this person will be saved because the desire to be saved by faith in Christ is the product of the work of the Holy Spirit in someone's heart. You don't desire that unless God gives you that desire. He causes you to believe that. He causes your faith. The great obje objection to the effectual calling is though that there will be some on that day of judgment that will come before God and say, I want to live, I want to be saved. And God will say no, even though we really want to in Christ. Never happen. 
If you want salvation through Christ, then you will be saved. Paul said this, Romans chapter 8, verse 30, all those whom God predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he justified, and those whom he justified, he will glorify. If he effectually called you, he's given you that desire, you profess Christ, you'll be saved. Now on the day of judgment, we can be sure of this. Everyone will want to be saved. Everyone will want to be saved. Every single person brought before a thrice holy God, that holy tribunal. When God opens up the books and all of our sin is made apparent and we see clearly that we've sinned against this most holy, most good God, we will say, yes, indeed, I deserve damnation. I deserve hell. Every single person at the judgment seat will want to be saved. But they will not want to be saved through Christ. They will not want to put their faith in Jesus to save them. Even in the face of hell, they will refuse to bow their knee to Christ, the glorious King. Will they want to escape judgment? Of course. Who stands before a judge when the judge says, I'm sentencing you to eternal life in jail, or I'm sentencing you to death? What prison is, no, no, you know, that's good. I, let's keep that. That's good. Everybody wants out. But their hearts have not changed. And we must remember this. The person who hates Jesus Christ on earth, the person who refuses to believe and be saved on earth, will hate Christ even more in his presence. And that means the heresy of second chance soteriology, if you heard this before, there are beliefs in some churches that argue that on that final day, if you did not believe here, God's going to give you one more chance. On that day when you stand before the judgment seat and all your sins are laid bare, God's going to say, now do you believe? That's heresy, by the way. But even if God did that, even if God did that, the unchanged heart will say in the face of hell, I will not believe. I will not trust Christ. For all eternity, if after a million years after Christ has come and established his kingdom on earth, a million years has passed, if God descended into hell and said, now, now will you believe, people would say, I will not believe. I will not trust in Christ. This is the depth of our rebellion against a glorious God. This is how wicked our sin is. I've often heard people teach that, you know, we essentially cast ourselves into hell by not following Christ and that we, we wouldn't want to get out if we were given the offer. That's foolishness. Of course, everybody who goes to hell would want to get out, but the condition is submission and loving obedience to Christ, and no one in hell will do that. So the great question, I believe, for us is this. How do you know you've entered the narrow gate? I mean, you're here. It's Sunday morning. It's the Lord's Day. I'm assuming you're here for a reason. I pray it's to worship God. How do you know that you're not like those many at the end of seven who come before Christ and he says, I do not know you? How do you know? Oh, you got to know. How do you know you haven't fooled yourself? All those who were standing before him said, did we not cast out demons? Did we not do many miracles? Did we not do all these great things in your name? They're in the church. They were externally associated with God's people. Just like us. Just like every person gathered in every church throughout the world today. If walking down an aisle, if saying a sinner's prayer, if getting baptized or taking communion does not provide assurance for my, my salvation, then what does? I mean, how can I know? Can you be assured of your salvation? What's the Bible say? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. But not in the ways that many churches teach today. Not in many ways. Many in attendance here in the, in the South Bay Many are attending churches this morning with Bible in hand, listening with all their might, still on the easy path, presuming that they will enter the narrow gate because their parents raised them in the faith, because at some early age they made a profession, 
because at some early age they got baptized, and they presume that therefore they have Christ when in fact they're still on the easy path. Many this morning here in the South Bay, still going through the wide gate, presume they have eternal life because they read their Bible or they attend a Bible study, or they pray every day, or they engage in some Christian or religious or spiritual activity. Many here in the South Bay, still in rebellion against God, presume salvation because they agree with the orthodox teachings of the Bible. Many in Reformed circles who agree with Reformed theology but have never been born again presume salvation because they know truth. Knowing truth does not save you. Knowing Christ saves you. None of these things tell us what we want to know. I would say none of these things tell us what we need to know. But Paul does say examine yourself. He calls us to that. So there must be a means of examination. There must be some questions that we can ask. Paul said examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you what? You fail to meet the test. So I want to close by just asking questions. You'll have to answer them. There are several here. I, I have a few, and I, I could have listed probably 20 from the scriptures, but these are some good ones. These are some big ones. So I'm going to ask them, and as I ask these questions and talk about them briefly, I want you to ask and answer them in your heart. Don't just do a cognitive consideration. This is no game. You may not make it home tonight. This may be your last day on earth. You want to know Christ before you come before the judgment seat. So hear these questions, my beloved, and answer them honestly. Question number one, do you find your greatest joy in Christ? Is Christ your joy? Can you say in your heart that he's first? that you love him most, that you can't give him up. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, Jesus said, told this parable. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered it up. Then, in, listen to this, in his joy, in his joy, what joy? In finding the treasure. In his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and he buys the field so he can have the treasure. Is Jesus Christ your treasure? Would you sell it all for him? Would you give it all up for him? I mean everything. Husband, wife, children, home, job, country. Everything to have him. If you've been effectually called by God, then the effect God has made in your heart is Christ being your greatest joy. He's it. And you're not going to give up you're not going to give him up for anything. It doesn't matter what comes. The good times, the, you're not giving him up for anything. He's yours. You are his. So ask that question. Does he compare with anyone? I love in Luke 14, 26, Jesus said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And he's not saying, do you go hate your family? He's saying, do you love them more than you love me? In other words, Christ saying, I got to be first. You got to love me more than you love your spouse. You got to love me more than you love your mom. Now, that's hard, huh? You got to love me more than you love your grandchildren. That's hard, huh? Come on, grandmothers. Do you? First. Second question, along the same lines. Is there someone or something in your life for which you have an equal or greater affection for? Is there someone or something in your life for which you have an equal or greater affection for relative to God, relative to Christ? Again, from Luke 9, incredible passage. A man came up to Jesus and he said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those in my home. I'll follow you, but I, I, I'm going to do this first. I love you, but I love them, and I'm going to... Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Whew. You talk about a verse that'll level you. Is there a past way of life? 
Is there a present desire? Is there a future hope that is preventing you from following Jesus with all your life? I mean, you got Jesus, but you also have this. If you have this and Jesus, you don't have Christ. Anyone or anything have greater than or equal sway to your heart, in your heart, than Christ himself? Ask the question. Question number three. Do you humbly rely upon God for everything? Your identity, your joy, your daily provision, your protection, your own faith. Do you rely upon God for everything that you have? In Matthew chapter 18, the disciples were debating who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And they want to know, am I going to be on your left? Am I going to be on your right? And Jesus, the master teacher, grabs a little child, sets the child upon his lap, and he says this. Truly, truly, I say to you, that means listen up, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You'll never enter the narrow gate. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Children do not presume power because they have none. Children do not presume riches because they are poor. Children rely upon their parents for everything, for direction, for nourishment, for protection, for encouragement, everything. They are humbled by their position. So too is the believer in Christ. This is a hard one for me because I still have a very proud heart. But only the humble will inherit the kingdom of God. Question number four, are you persevering through trials? In Acts chapter 14, as Paul and Barnabas returned to Antioch, we're told in Acts 14, 22, that they did this. Listen, they strengthened the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. Now listen with all your might. And saying that through many trials, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Did you hear that? Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. That's why Christ said the gate is narrow and the way is what? The way is hard that leads to life. It's hard being a Christian. It's hard staying on that path. It's hard battling the flesh. Are you? Have you? Do you continue to engage in the trials and sufferings and hardship in faith? Are you now pursuing Christ Remaining faithful, albeit feebly at times. We fail, do we not? We fail in the hardships. But do you come back? Do you say, Lord, forgive me. I was not faithful. I struggled with my sin. I succumbed to it. Forgive me, Father. The humble child will. Or have you, have you given up? Have you given up? You say, I'm, I'm in church. That doesn't mean it. Have you given up? When things get really hard, do you just run to the besetting sin? Do you go to the idol? Then when things ease up, do you go back and worship God? Jesus said in Matthew 24, 13, the one who endures to the end will be saved. Question number five, do you desire and are you striving to do the will of God? Do you desire it and are you striving to do it? A few verses later, in Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Will doing, doing the will of God, is part of our effectual calling. This means, are you growing in your knowledge of God through his word? And are you submitting to it joyfully? Are you growing in it? Are you seeing your life transformed day by day, year after year, by love and submission in your following of Christ? Are you seeing your love for the lost grow? Are you seeing your love for your brothers and sisters in Christ grow? John said in first, in, uh, Jesus said in John 13, 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have a love for one another. That's a great indicator. Do you have a love for each other? All right, last question. Are you pursuing and growing in righteousness? Are you pursuing and growing in righteousness? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, or do you not know that the righteous, I'm sorry, do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? You can rephrase that. The unrighteous will not enter the narrow gate. Do not be deceived. 
neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. My beloved, this is not a call to perfection, so don't twist these questions. Are you pursuing it? Is your life directed toward it? Is Christ seated upon the throne of your heart? Do you desire to know him more today than you did yesterday? Do you desire to be more obedient to his teaches, teachings today than you were yesterday? When you, when you think about your end and aim, is it God? Is it God himself? And that relationship you, you have and want to have with him? Or is it just escaping hell? Is it overcoming the punishment? Or is it him? An assurance of our salvation, my beloved, is a gift from God. Knowing that you know him. Ask God this morning to give you that assurance, real assurance. Go back over these questions this week and contemplate them deeply and ask, Lord, does this characterize my life? Not at this moment, because in our life in Christ, there will be times when you stumble and fall, but is this, does this describe me? Is Christ number one in my life? Do I want to do God's will? If you find yourself lacking significantly in these areas, do not despair. Repent and believe. Remember, the call is universal. The call is going out to you. So if you go through these questions and you're discouraged and you're moaning and thinking, I do not pursue righteousness. I do not strive to do his will. I do not love him most. Then repent and believe and God will come and he will change your heart. The Bible says everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. I know many churches have cheapened that as some process by which we trick God into salvation. But in its truthfulness, it is glorious. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Be sure of this. God is calling you. Why will you die? I want you to be encouraged this morning. I want you to leave here with an assurance of salvation in Christ. If you don't have it, I want you to repent and believe that you might. Warnings like this are loving statements by a glorious God. Hear the warning well and put your faith in Christ. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would forgive me if in any way I have taken this teaching and made it harder to hear or even more confusing. I know it is probable, Lord, that there are some here this morning that have professed Christ all their life maybe attended church, maybe taught a Bible study, who may not really know you. They've heard the universal call to repent and believe, but they have not surrendered their heart to Christ. If there are any this morning, Father, I pray, I plead, I beg that you would save them, that you would bring your effectual calling upon them, that you would show them that indeed they are sinful through and through and need Christ to save them, and I pray you would save them. I ask, Lord, that you would exercise this great work upon many of the churches here this morning in the South Bay. How many, Father, have gathered presuming to know you but do not know you? Too many. 
Forgive us, Father, for taking lightly this warning, for thinking somehow if we, if we say a prayer or, or we get baptized that that means we've truly been converted. Show us, Father, the need for Christ to save us and then show us that salvation. I don't care, Father, how long someone's been in the faith or someone's attended church. I pray you show each and every one of us. This danger is very real. We recognize it now all too well. We want to enter by the narrow gate. We want to be the few that find life in Christ. Bless us to that end, I pray. Bless our families to that end, I pray. Bless our mouths that we might go to our coworkers and our neighbors and tell them of this great gospel call that we might be like Christ and we might say to people, enter the narrow gate, why must you die? Open our mouths, Father. Let us not be so selfish with this great news. I praise you for being a God who redeems sinners like us and keeping us, preserving us to the end. Continue to do that mighty work that you might be glorified here in this place, in this beautiful little church, in this very dark town. We ask that you would be glorified in Christ. In his name, amen. Let's stand and let's sing.